Okay, you guys ready? Um, thanks for coming to my talk. I'll be talking about using dependent types uh, in numerical optimization algorithms. And this will be covering linear algebra, but don't worry, you don't have to know too much linear algebra. I'm gonna go over it very uh, calmly, ideally. Um, and I definitely appreciate you coming to this talk. There's so many great ones. I wanna go to the Rust one, so I feel like it's unfortunate I don't get to go, but you, know, you can see it on video. Um, so what are we gonna talk about today? So today we're gonna to talk about um, kind of how do we, what is the first thought process of what is a numerical optimization algorithm? Um, and we're gonna go through that by going through an example of what's called an inverse problem. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about type level literals. So type level, level literals are what allow us to encode what are called dependently typed things in Haskell. Um, Haskell is not a, this talk is in Haskell. Haskell is not a fully dependent language. So we're simulating some things of what you could do with dependent types. Um, then I'm going to talk about how we can solve problems by constraining kind of the models that we introduce in the example. And I'm going to end it with some medical imaging examples from the work that I do during my day-to-day -day job. Um, so let's get started. Let's start with a simple problem. So the simple problem is, is that we have two speakers that are both a meter apart from each other and two people who want to measure how much sound is being output by these two speakers in milliwatts. So we'll have two people with their phones with those nice uh, decibel meter apps or if you're uh, whenever the Apple beta comes out, they'll be on your watch too. It'll tell you how, how loud it is. Both people are positioned one meter away from whatever respective speaker they're closer to. So M1 is one meter from P1, the speaker, and M2 is one meter from P2. Um, so Alice and Bob, they want to take these measurements of basically how loud it is in the room. And they want to figure out from that information, can I deduce what the output power of the speaker was? Right? So the equations at play here are P1 and P2, the power of the speakers, and the two measurements that we take. So how do we go about trying to think about this type of problem? Well, we can start off by trying to think about how does sound propagate in a room or in any space, right? So sound propagates from an initial power that you give out to the speaker P by the ratio P divided by uh, four pi r squared, which uh, if you remember your geometry, that four pi r squared is the surface area of a sphere. So basically the energy of a speaker or the sound that it makes is dissipated on the surface area. And so the farther you go out, the less sound you hear because you're hearing only a section of basically that surface area. And so what they'll measure is M, depending on how far they are away. So if we have our two people, Alice and Bob, um, measuring two different, um, the two different speakers, they'll get a sum of the two speakers, right? They won't know which one they're getting. They're just getting a loudness in the room. And so what they'll get is, if we say this first person, Alice's measurement, M1, um, we'll say that she gets basically the power from the first speaker divided by her distance to that speaker squared, four pi of that, and the second speaker as well, same relation. And then for Bob, M2, we'll have the same equation except for the distances between Bob and the speaker is slightly different than the distances between Alice and the speaker, right? Um, and one thing that's kind of important in this example is that uh, they're not over top of each other. If Alice and Bob were like, uh, usually Alice and Bob are quantum mechanics so they could live in the same space. That's not true in reality. But if they did, this measurement wouldn't work. Um, so there's a little bit of a constraint there. So we can write this as uh, linear algebra. How many people are a little comfortable with linear algebra? Good, sweet. So this is not like too scary. Um, we can write our system that we have here as the equations that we had as a model S and then multiplied by a matrix vector multiplied by the powers of the speakers and we get out our measurements. So notice oftentimes, and I'll be uh, harping on this a few times, S is called a model. So a lot of times what a matrix represents when we use it, at least in kind of physics and in uh, medical imaging and stuff like that is a model of how the real world responds to some sort of stimuli. Then we have our P, which is a vector of size two, right? So we're taking, there's two speakers. So we have, we know that this vector has to be of size two. And we know that we have two measurements, right? We have the Alice um, iPhone, or I guess if you use Android, um, it's your, your choice, um, or um, Bob's dB meter. So how do we kind of solve this problem? Well, the general formulation of such a problem um, is called what's a forward model-based reconstruction. So um, if you guys remember from your linear algebra classes, um, basically what we want to try to find is what this term means, the whole term means is that, say I have a candidate solution that I want, P. 
I'll take it and uh, multiply it by our model, which will give me what I would expect to measure if that was the true output powers. And then this is what we measured. And then basically this whole like double bracket with the two thing means how close am I between my guess at the solution and what the actual thing I measured was. So this is often called a data consistency term. Can I just invert the matrix? Yes, <laughs> you can. But I'm describing it this way because we'll get to a little more complicated thing later. Uh, subject to P, not X. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Well, you always have a typo in your presentations, right? So normally in linear algebra, you use X as the variable. This should be P as an element of some size n. Okay. In this case, it's size 2. But yes, you're correct. Um, so optimization algorithms are written, or like the reason why is we'll be focusing on algorithms that solve problems of you're trying to find the smallest solution to a problem given some constraints, which is basically what this means. And is that like the um, distance mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, this is the Euclidean norm. Okay. Yep. OK, so for this particular case, uh, our matrix, if you know matrices, um, we can invert it and then multiply it by our measurements to get back our powers. This only works in certain cases. Our problem is nice. If I had said if Alice and Bob were co-located, you couldn't invert the matrix. The matrix would be, have a property what's called singular. We basically don't have enough information in our model to be able to reconstruct. But in this case, to solve this problem, we can use this formula. So we want to write a Haskell program um, to be able to actually measure, given our measurements, figure out what the sound power was. So again, we have that equation. And then basically what we'll do is uh, just write it up in simple Haskell. So we have a function sound power that takes a vector of doubles and gives you a vector of doubles. You can think of this is from the vector library, but you can think of it as like a list. Um, and what we do is we take the inverse of S and do the matrix vector multiply by M. This operator here, it's a little funny the way it's written, but that's just how it is in the linear algebra package for Haskell. And here, we have to construct our matrix S, right? We have to construct what our model is. So we have a two by two matrix of basically, we have our equation for how sound propagates. And then we have the different elements depending on how far any person is from that given element, uh, given speaker. So yeah, all the uh, actual functions that do the linear algebra are from H matrix, um, which we'll be using heavily in this talk. So say I measure, or Alice measures, Alice and Bob measure two powers, and we're gonna, you could measure them in dB, but we're gonna measure them in watts per meter squared because that way I don't have to deal with the log. Um, so they measure this ungodly like, amount of watts per meter squared, like a, a really long number, and they wanna basically be able to output, uh, reconstruct how much power was being output by the speakers. So you make a vector with the two elements that you measured, put it through the sound power thing, and then, voila, you get out, well, if you print it, <laughs> otherwise you don't see it, you get out that one of the speakers was outputting at 10 milliwatts, and the other one was outputting at 5 milliwatts. Um, the, way, um, the way I basically originally made this is that you put this into the model to get what the measurements are, and then it's just doing the reverse, if you're wondering where those numbers came from. So great. You know, now what we want to do is we want to try new measurements that we've measured. So we call our sound power thing, and we call it with the vector, but as you might probably be able to see where this is going, I've made a mistake, right? And the mistake is, is that I've accidentally only taken one measurement. And so that case, what happens is that, unfortunately, everything type checks, right? Everything works, but when I try to call it, the underlying, a lot of these uh, LAPAC or LAPAC and BLOS and stuff like that, they're written in Fortran, the Fortran code way underneath is like, I don't understand. I don't understand what you gave me because the shapes don't match. So basically it's, I was expecting, since you gave me a matrix that was size two by two, but you only gave me a vector that was of size one, I don't know how to handle that. And so instead of giving you anything nice, it just throws an exception. And this is what I deal with like every day. <laughs> it's very annoying. Um, I work, okay, so I should be ashamed. I work in Python. Well, not ashamed, but like, I wish I was working in Haskell. So we're going to show how we can solve this in Haskell. Um, what we'd really like to be able to do is we'd like to be able to say that our vectors are a certain size and that our matrices are a certain size, right? We'd want to be able to encode the fact that we can only handle matrices of certain sizes and vectors that are applied to them that have the same size that we expect for that given matrix. So this is what we're going to aim for. We're going to aim for a sound power function that is type safe such that when we call LAPAC, LAPAC on the back end, it will never throw that exception for us. 
So how do we do this? So we do what's called type level literals. So GHC has a, it's an internal library. It's very easy to call though um, for expressing um, strings, booleans, and natural numbers at the type level. So basically one thing you could do if you're in GHCI and you enable both the data kinds extension and import this module, um, you can ask what five is and it will tell you that it's a value of, in this case it's constrained by num because I didn't say what type of number it is. But you'll also notice that five lives on the type level. It has a kind and the kind in this case instead of being just a normal type is type nat, which means that uh, we can basically uh, do what I had showed in the previous slide for sound power. We can take our natural numbers and put them in spots that we would normally put types, which is really awesome. So a lot of times, this is kind of like the canonical example of dependent, dependent types. If you've ever read an article, it's always about vector, right? It's always about, I have a vector of this size and I'm indexing through it or I'm looping over it in some, or not looping, doing a fold over it. Um, but basically, the dependent types are where the particular type you have depends on the value that you have. So you have a, um, you don't just have a vector of doubles, which could be any size. You specifically, when you have a vector of five doubles, and you'll have a type, if you have a vector that's only four in them, you will, that type is a vector of four doubles. So what can we do with this kind of uh, information? So there are also, if you're familiar with Haskell, there's these things called type families. I'm not gonna go over them because it's more complicated, but basically the kind of concept that you get with them is that you can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, exponentiation, a few other things on the type level. So you can take type level natural numbers and add them or subtract them in order to get more complicated types, but that still makes sense to your problem. Um, and you can solve the constraints even though you have these kind of more difficult algebraic concepts in the type. And then additionally, one other thing that we'll use from on the type level from Haskell is this, um, it's written a little funny, but it's a less than or equal to. So it basically just says, is some natural number on the type level less than or equal to some other natural number? And returns to you a bool. Normally you would check for whether or not this equality is equal to true, unless you wanted to check for it was false, but you can do either. So I'll show you a little bit of using this. I should really use this far more often in the talk because if uh, vectors of size zero don't make a lot of sense for linear algebra, you're not really solving anything, right? But it became tedious to write it all over the place. So this would have been kind bool or kind bool? Kind bool. Well, yeah. yeah there, I guess there should be like, if you were on the, um, so natural numbers, you just use the natural, like you just use the um, number itself on the type level. When you're using type literals, oftentimes you'll see a backtick in front. So that just means that it's on the, you're using it in a spot that you'd use it where a type is. So great, now what are we gonna, what we wanna do is we wanna make two constructors. Um, so the two constructors are gonna be, so this fancy symbol is just for the uh, doubles, right? Um, we wanna make a vector, so we wanna put in that dot up there an n. So we wanna take a natural number and return a type. So if we say put in four there, then what we expect back is vectors of size four. And then this one where it's a dot cross dot, we expect two numbers, right? So we're gonna give that type constructor two different numbers, say two and three, and get back the type of matrices that have the shape two by three. And I've written it out in order to match kind of the mathematics and make a, I've been trying to figure out which domain to really live in, but I've mostly written it in terms of math syntax. But if you want to write it in code, this is how you would do it with the H matrix um, library. So for example, as I had said, a uh, vector of size two is this R to the two and a matrix is of two by three is R to the two by three. So how does uh, H matrix accomplish this? So Basically what it does is that it uses a phantom type. So what it says is that it will add a dimension to some thing that you have as a data constructor, but the type of it, it will just magically add that natural number for you. And so for example, the vector is really, you take a N, whatever that natural number is when you're just constructing the type, and you basically just um, add it in, regardless of what this vector of double is. And then there's this make R function, which just calls, um, the constructor after it's called the dimensioning phantom type. Um, so this makes, uh, if you, if we, there's a similar constructor for matrices. So there's 
An interesting thing about this, what stops me from running my constructor with a vector where I've given it too many sizes, too many elements, and I say that it's an element of size two, a vector of size two? Well, nothing. There's nothing that stops me from doing this. So there's a variety of ways to encode this type of concept, this dependently type concept. The way that the linear algebra library H matrix does this is basically, basically through a bunch of smart constructors. Is that there, it's always like, uh, it's checking something, uh, or it knows something has to be true, such that um, it extracts the unsafe parts that are not shaped correctly, and then does whatever linear algebra needs and gives it back to you, but adds the shape again. But we already know, like for example, if it's a matrix vector multiply, it'll extract the matrix, it'll extract the vector, do the multiplication, and put it back. And so it assumes that LAPAC will do the right thing, which is true. It's been doing it for like 40 years, so hopefully it keeps doing it. But there's some information about how to do other types of dependently, other ways to encode this. But this works great for the linear algebra that we have. So let's figure out how to uh, kind of encode some of these things. So um, say I want to make a matrix made up of blocks. What I'll do is that I'll basically um, use this constructor, which allows me to take two matrices, and assuming that the number of rows is the same, I can combine them. And now my new matrix, when I've slapped the two together side by side, has the number of columns equal to the sum of the prior ones. And similarly for here, this is vertical concatenation. I have two matrices where the number of columns are the same, as shown by this component here. And I've added this. These constraints are basically just to bring things into scope. Um, and then here, I'm saying that the number of rows are as equal to the sum of the two rows that I smacked on top of each other. So cool, let's try to make a two by two matrix. So first we'll use this function const to generate a one by one matrix from a double. And then we could just use this, uh, the functions that we have to generate the two by two matrix. It's literally just like matrix here, matrix here, matrix here, matrix here. Um, what if we made an error? Right? What if we made an error in trying to define how we do single element matrices? We accidentally made a, a one by two matrix. Well, now when we try to make our two by two matrix, we get a type error. It actually happens right here. Well, the problem is, is that I've constrained the output to be of size two, but when I add, when I try to horizontally concatenate this, the number of columns to be two, it says, hey, I got four. I don't understand what you're talking about, right? So at compile time, it tells me I have a problem. Const is just like a, um, it basically just makes a matrix or a vector of filled completely with that element of a certain shape. Um, so now we can define our sound power as we did before. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm going through puberty. Um, so we have our equation and we have our matrix. But now, see, we actually specify what we're taking in. Excellent. Um, so when we try to call this with the const, const has an ability to just take a number and make a vector out of it. Um, so we try to apply it to a, a one vector to our sound power, and we get a problem up the, when we try to compile. It says it can't match type one with type two. So now we have, no longer are we throwing an exception at runtime, we're throwing an exception at compile time. So what do we gain from this example? We start off with a numerical problem that was mathematically correct, right? We understood how it worked from a linear algebra standpoint. But we found out our function was partial because of ways that we could apply the linear, we could actually run the function, right? We weren't constrained to actually follow the rules of linear algebra as we had originally written them. And then we made our function more robust by representing the shapes of our data in the type. So now we're going to run away and do very different types of problems using this concept. So I wanna minimize, in my day-to-day -day job, I often minimize a function that looks like this. It's a function, big F, that contains two pieces, little f and g. So f is called a cost function sometimes. Um, it's basically um, part of that forward model. f is a smooth convex function, which I won't get into what a convex function is, but basically it's like a quadratic. It, is a, it has a nice shape with a global minimum. And g also is a convex function, but it's not necessarily smooth. So it also has a global minimum, but it might look more like a square wave. So how do we, how would I write like a problem in this formulation? So say we have a thousand speakers in the room 
and we have only 200 measurements because there's only 200 people at the conference, and, but for some reason you decide to buy 1,000 speakers. Can we reconstruct how much power is being output by each speaker with the constraint that we know that only a handful of the speakers are on, right? So we can write this problem this way. Uh, minimize, this is F and this is G. This is just the data consistency term. This says that given our model of how the speaker sound propagates and the power of each speaker, we're gonna compare that to our measurements and try to minimize that. But notice we've taken only 200 measurements, which means that there's a lot of cases where this is zero, where our distance is zero because we haven't sampled the space fully. And then the other term here, this, it's the same, they're both called norms. This is the L1 norm. Basically is a constraint that tries to promote that our signal is sparse. So these two pieces together work to say that I want something that matches my measurements, but I want a signal that's sparse in my reconstruction because I know that from some prior information. And Lambda trades off how much we care, which one we care about more, the data consistency or the sparsity. Make Lambda really high, I'll get a sparse signal that's just zeros because that's the optimal solution to a sparse signal. There's no elements that are non-zero. If I make it zero, then I get back the reconstruction we did before. So how are we gonna do this? So FISTA is, is an algorithm for solving this type of problem. It's called a proximal problem. So generally what you have is you have a function. It's convex, so it's kind of in the shape of these are like the level sets of that function. So if you think of this as the minimum, and then you would go out higher and higher values. When I get to the center, we can't look at it graphically, unfortunately. So what do we do? We start, it's a gradient descent algorithm, as I'm sure you guys have seen probably before. You start at some position, and then you move along the gradient of F in order to kind of get closer to your answer. But F is not the thing you're trying to solve, so you're actually kind of going a little bit in the wrong direction, right? So what you'll also need is this proximal operator G, which is a different type of step. And what G will basically say is, I want to actually head back towards the sum of these two elements. So there's two steps, two different, uh, two different, well, one's a gradient and one's a step, but to try to find the minimum. And we basically keep alternating between doing a gradient step and a proximal step. That's the whole algorithm. It's really nothing more complicated than that. So for that, we're going to need a few pieces. We're going to need to define basically the gradient operator of our function. So F we wrote this way, and here's where I got that X from, because usually it's written this way. The gradient of it, um, you can expand out the two norm and then do some fun matrix derivatives. Matrix derivatives do not follow standard derivative forms, so uh, have fun. <laughs> but we can write this up in Haskell. So here, um, our function F is basically, we know uh, we wanna deal with problems that are at least of some size, right? We add these into the constraints. And we know that we have a model, our A, of size m by n, a set of measurements, b, size n, and our candidate solution. So that's like wherever we are in our stepping. And this should give us back a number. Um, so here, we've constructed uh, this function, and you can do it just with normal H matrix, but what's convenient about this is that it's very hard to screw up. If I switch x and b, it doesn't type check because I'm switching a vector of n for a vector of m. And similarly, if I put the a in a spot that doesn't make sense, it will also basically tell me that my numbers don't quite, my natural numbers don't quite type check. And then here the a transpose ax minus b is written similarly, and again has some of those guarantees. I can't mix up which one's my measurement and which one's my candidate solution. If I did so, the compiler would tell me that the numbers, the shapes don't match. There's, yeah, um, well, there's a little shortcut. It's just like, instead of less than equal to question mark, it's just less than or equal to. Oh, okay. It's a type cinema, synonym. Oh. Um, so similarly for the proximal function, um, I'm definitely not gonna get into how we derive that one. Um, but so the G function is just the one norm times lambda. And the proximal operator is basically, we take each element in the vector and then we, if it's close to zero, we say it's zero. This, what this function does is if it's close to zero, you keep it zero. Otherwise, if it's a certain distance out, you keep it at whatever value it was. So what we do is, since that's for each element, there's a map function for typed vectors. And we basically apply the function that we have to each element of that vector. It's not quite a functor because 
all our matrices, all our vectors and matrices are defined specifically in terms of the type double. So you can't have um, vectors of tuples of a certain size. We're dealing only with double numbers. So again, this is what we kind of want to do. Um, we want to step first by F using the gradient F, and then we want to step by G. Yes? I, I think I may have just missed you say it, but what does prox G represent mathematically with respect to G? Um, so prox G is basically a way in which to kind of, you have a problem, you have an answer, but it doesn't quite fit your model of whatever G is. And so what it does is it forces it into what makes sense for G. It does a, what's called a projection. Um, so it, so for example, if you have a box constraint, that's one of the things you can use for G, that it must be inside a box. The prox G operator just says, if I'm outside the box, put me in the box, like at the, at the edge. Okay. Okay. Would you say like this is a bias? It sounds like you're adding bias to your equation with this box. Yeah, yeah. So basically whenever we have like these kind of two terms where we're using a lambda, we're kind of choosing which one we want to trade off between. Is it like, do we want to go for something that matches the data consistency term more, or do we want to bias and focus on things that are sparse? So FISTA requires, this is the type signature, um, it requires our, we don't actually need the cost um, to solve it. We just need the gradient and the proximal operator, and this thing called the Lipschitz constant, which is basically a bound on how big the derivative can be. And then I'm gonna give it an initial guess. I, it's a maybe, because if you give it nothing, then it will just default to zeros. That's a pretty common thing. Um, and what it will give back is a list of steps that I made as I tried to optimize that function. Right, so here it is in all its glory. Um, the gradient step is just, I'm gonna move in a, uh, this is basically calculating which direction to step. And this is my previous place that I was. So it's a step in that direction from where I was previously. And then this proximal thing is, uh, the part that does the projection that keeps my solutions in the space that I want them. And then all I do is iterate. So this algorithm is literally, I take my previous, it, it's run, uh, you can see up here it says iterate go. Um, you just update your solution. You come up with this term T, which basically says how much I wanna trade off what I was doing last time versus this time. This parameter is very specific to get very fast convergence. It can be you can almost choose anything here, but if you want fast convergence, you have to use this particular number. And then you can update where you're going based on the kind of last two, where you step to and where you were before. You might not, sometimes you'll step too far, which is the purpose of this last statement. It's like, oh, well, my gradient took me way too far this time. I'm gonna pull it back a little bit. And then I'm gonna iterate over and over again. And again, the types help us here because I can't make a gradient function. I have to pass in gradient and proximal operator functions that match, right? I can't have one that returns a size M and one that returns a size N and takes in a size N where N and M are different. So that's great. Um, again, so that's all there is to FISTA. Um, so say we have a model as our speaker system. We take 200 measurements of a thousand speakers and say we know that only I happen to know that it's sparse. In this case, I'm gonna know that there are only 30 speakers that are on. So we have our set of measurements, M200, um, M of size 200, and it's sparse. So how do we solve this? If we want, we can generate the cost function and a list of costs, but really what we're just gonna do is call our, solution, our FISTA by putting in the parameters that we want. The gradient step, the proximal step, the uh, how big the derivative could possibly be, and what our initial guess was, in this case zeros. So if our original signal looked like this, where these, each index here is a different speaker, and basically it's whether or not it has, say, one milliwatt of power, um, or one of whatever power as its input. If we run our steps and we take 100 steps, we get actually what we got as our original uh, system, great. We can solve a problem that's kind of a little weird. Um, <laughs> I don't know how often you solve these problems. I solve these problems all the time. So <laughs> um, just as a kind of reference, FISA was able to solve this. If we set lambda to zero, we said we didn't want that proximal step and we were only optimizing for the data consistency, we get this, basically random noise. What this says is that because we've taken too few measurements, the optimal solution, because it wants to find a solution that's the smallest when you do the data consistency, there's a lot of those answers. And so it just chooses the smallest one it can find. 
So um, this is great and all. We are now able to solve proximal operator problems. But one problem is um, A can be huge, right? So if you've dealt with matrices before, a lot of times when you're like starting off in linear algebra class, you'll deal with size two by two, three by three, four by four, um, those kinds of things. My problem that I'm working on this last week is size 23 million <laughs> as the its input, and it gives me three million output elements. That matrix, if it was fully realized, if you had all the elements, is 570 terabytes. That's a lot of space, right? And I solve it on this thing, this MacBook Air. So I'm gonna tell you that we can solve it more quickly than using this A matrix. This is where it gets all functionally. Oh, extra cool. So what if I'm gonna tell you is that the matrix is really inefficient, <laughs> we're gonna ditch it. So what are the operators? So when we were solving that problem, what was the important things that we had? We had the matrix applied to a vector. We had the transpose of the matrix applied to a vector. And that was basically it. <laughs> That's all there is. So first order methods, these are called first order methods, basically only ever required those two pieces. So what a matrix really represents is a pair of two functions. It's a function that goes from your input space of size n and gives you something in your output space of size m. And similarly, another function, an adjoint that goes from your output space, size m, and goes back to your input space, size n. So we can write this up as a data type, right? So we write it up, the f means free for matrix free. This formulation is in the literature called matrix free. So we have a type constructor that takes two numbers. And what we do is to our data constructor, we have this forward function I described, the adjoint function, and we return our type of size M and N. So the adjoint function is not the same as the inverse? No, it is not the same as the inverse. So a lot of times what will happen, if you're lucky, it's the inverse. Okay. Um, there are certain cases, unitary matrices are invertible. The transpose is the inverse. But that's not always the case. So that's a good point. More like a transpose. Yes. So one example is like, say I wanted to take a vector and I wanted to sum its elements, a certain sets of its elements, right? Like maybe I'll stride over that vector in certain pieces and take the subpieces. If I try to put that back, I don't know how to put it back. There's not, I don't have enough information when I try to put those numbers that I've calculated back into the original size. And so it will actually add numbers that overlap, which is not an inverse, right? So just to make sure that we're sane, we can do this from our original matrix, size matrix, we can turn it into a matrix free form, which is a little bit of a, like a hack because we're basically just saying we have our matrix where this is actually a real matrix, the big fully dense one, and it's multiplied by some vector and the transpose of A multiplied by some vector. So this is just to, as a sanity check. This is also convenient when you're dealing with these kinds of forms and you don't know how to represent the matrix as matrix free yet. You could skip it for a second and basically put the matrix into a, vector, into a function. So let's look at some example um, matrix-free operators. There's the identity matrix, so which everyone knows and loves. Um, it's one of my favorites. <laughs> um, so the identity function, really all it does is it takes your input vector and returns it to you, right? And it has to be square. So here, given that we know a constraint of known nat size n, we return a matrix of size n by n, or a matrix-free version of size n by n, where the forward and adjoint functions are both identity, right? So we do nothing to the, to the input that we have. There's another matrix, I use this one. Um, I don't think it's pretty common, but basically what it is is um, every element in the matrix is the size of the vector. Um, and what it does is it does an average. So it, does, it gets the average value of that vector and then repeats it to the size of the original vector that I had. So if I wanna do this matrix free, I'm gonna need two functions. I'm gonna start off with an average function. And what the average function does is it takes this vector and um, basically multiplies it by um, one over n, where n is the size of the vector. And the way we get it out, there's a little bit of a trick, but basically um, you can define this proxy object, which is a type proxy n, where this n comes out. It allows you to basically pull out the natural number from the type level and use it on the value level. 
So now we're saying, what this basically says is, multiply each element in the vector by the fact that I have its shape, one over n, and then add them all up. So that's not the matrix, right? The matrix is that I want to repeat it. So I take that um, average function, that average value that I get for a given um, vector, and I'm going to make a const. Remember, const is one of those functions where it comes out with a shape, but I don't have to give the shape here. It knows what the shape is. I've already just constrained that. So I actually can't, if I was to do this in Python, I could easily say, like, make a constant vector, and I made it of size four, always, on accident, right? But here, the types tell us, or give us a constraint that my vector has to be a certain size. Is there like a general way to look at the matrix and see its uh, forward and natural rate functions? Or do you have to kind of eyeball it, basically, and figure it out? Uh, you, would, you would earn a lot of money and be a very famous researcher if you solved that problem. Okay. Um, I'd like to be able to, but there's no, generally you kind of, for a given matrix, well, okay, there's kind of two ways of constructing matrices that I use. I often have a physical model, right. and then I make the matrix. So then I have a good understanding of what the forward and adjoint should be. Yeah. You can also then try to just figure out, given the matrix that you have, kind of intuit through it. Okay, but like for any matrix, you can completely describe it using these two linear transformations. Uh, uh, what do you care about, at least? Yeah, so like there's a lot of other things you can do with matrices. Um, so this is like at least the parts that I care about. Okay. Yeah. The matrix not determined just by the forward function? Um, yeah, so in this case, it is like, so technically you would have a pair of matrices, right? One was the matrix itself and the transposed matrix, which is a different matrix technically, um, and both of them just have the forward. I happen to pair it up this way because I often need them in pairs. I need the forward fund, and I'm going to make the transposed matrix, so I'm going to need its adjoint as well. But can you not like create a higher order function that takes in the, the free representation of the matrix and automatically derive the transpose? Um, uh, you, automatically deriving transposes is very hard. Okay. Um, but we will get to higher order. The next slide is about higher order, or no, the slide after is about higher order things. How many people are familiar with the Fourier transform? Awesome. This is a weird crowd. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> in which case, I don't need to describe necessarily this slide too much, but you have a, some value, some signal that's over time, and you can represent that as a series of sine waves which is what the transform does. It tells you, actually, it's made up of, say, this, this, and this sine wave, right? You can convert between them. So assuming I have a good f of t function in Haskell and a good i f of t function in Haskell, and I'm using the unitary version of f of t, then I can define my matrix freeform like this, where now I have something more complicated. It's still an n by n, but my forward and transpose functions are a little bit different. What this example brings up is something quite interesting, though. Before, if I had, you can write the Fourier transform as a discrete Fourier transform, which takes up size n squared for the size of your vector and takes up n time, n squared time, the matrix vector multiply. It is a completely dense matrix. However, when I write it matrix free and I do these operations, the f of t function is n log n. And the space it takes, it basically overwrites the vector. You, well, some implementations can overwrite the vector it starts off with. It's only of size n. So here, we significantly reduce the amount of space that we require. And we also get faster time. So that's great and all. Now, how do we use these things? How do we actually like build bigger pieces with them? So one thing that we want to do is we want to do the matrix vector multiply. That's the primary thing we're going to be doing with our matrices, right? So here we're going to extract the forward function and just apply it. Now note here, because of the size of the shapes again, I can't use the adjoint function. I can't make a mistake. It's the wrong shape. And similarly, I can do the transpose. So here's where that I make a new vector. I do make a new matrix. And what I do when I transpose is I just flip which one is forward and which one is the adjoint function, right? And I can't accidentally put A and A here or F and F here because that would not be the right shape. So there's only one way to make these functions without, you could always like put in, well, undefined is the famous one, but you could always put in, um, say, ID or something like that to try to get around this. But given what you have to start off with, what's introduced in your function, there's only one way to define this. If the matrices were square, though, presumably it would detect the number around. Yeah. 
and there's other ways you can handle that. I'm trying to gloss over that part. But, um, so matrices have two properties. We can multiply them by a, because they're linear functions. So that means we can scale them. So how do we do that? We want to take a double and our matrix-free matrix, linear operator. And what we can do is we can basically say, is that multiplication, instead of multiplying the matrix, is we multiply the output of the result, right? So here we take our previous matrix-free function and we make a new one where what it does is it passes the vector, um, it calculates the vector and then multiplies it by that constant. And then similarly for the adjoint. The um, transpose function, or sorry, the transpose function, the other function with linearity is add, right? So if I add two matrices, I can literally add them element by element or I can add their outputs. So if I write this, I take my two different functions and I add them together, uh, make a new forward function that adds the two vectors together of whatever my input is. And again, remember, as I had said before, I can't mix up my A's and my F's unless there's that specific case of squares. Um, otherwise, actually I can't do it here because I haven't added the constraint that M and N are the same. If I added that constraint, then I could do that, but since I haven't said that, it doesn't know. Um, so for example, say we wanna take the identity, make this matrix, the identity minus that average thing that I defined before. So really in Haskell, all we have to do is we take our matrix free function, add it to negative one times our averaged um, piece of that vector. So remember the average one takes the average of the vector and just repeats it. So that way I could do a simple subtraction. So here, all the functions are composed through the addition. I don't have to write it myself. Um, the other, there's ways, there's many more ways to compose or com smack two things together, but the primary other big one is matrix multiply, which is not just element, well, it is sort of element by element, but not the same. Um, oftentimes, your model of whatever a system is can be broke up into several different pieces. And you can matrix multiply them together to get a bigger model of your system. So for that, we do matrix vector multiply, or I'm sorry, matrix, matrix multiply. And here, again, the same thing where we take our inputs, break out the two functions, and compose the internal pieces. And again, I can only write this, assuming I don't introduce anything else, one way. So what this basically says is, my output is gonna be, my new forward function is, I'm gonna take whatever input vector I have, run it through B, then run it through A, and give me a result. The transpose of that, because when you transpose the two matrices flip, is you run it through A first, the adjoint function, the A adjoint function, and then the B adjoint function. So this allows us to easily compose our models. Now say I do something like this. I make, um, one of the silly things about, or one of the funny things about Haskell is since I can't use capital letters, it's really hard to like read this in my mind. <laughs> but say I have a matrix B plus C matrix multiplied by a scaled version of D, right? How do I go about writing my gradient function that I had before, right? That was the big thing that used A. Well, since I have the matrix, uh, the matrix free version of matrix vector multiply, and I can do transposes of A, I can use the exact same form I had before. No changes. No changes in logic. I could do the exact type of linear algebra that I was used to doing but everything on the back end is just functions that have been composed together, called in the right places, and vector outputs in the right spots. And even better is that I can't accidentally at some point make a matrix that makes no sense. So now we can do this with far less memory and time. Um, and I'm gonna go a little bit. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different times where you can put different things into a matrix. So for example, sometimes if the matrix is really sparse to start off with, I'll just wrap it up. Um, however, other times, uh, a lot of other times, the matrix is pretty dense and I'll make a function for it. But it, you, can, you are afforded that trade-off in this formulation. In this formulation, you can choose which pieces you want to be fully dense, which parses you want to be sparse, which pieces you want to be functions, and it all just composes, right? So I'm going over time, but I'm hoping that this is interesting enough for you guys to stay for five minutes. So I work on this thing. This is called a magnetic particle imaging scanner. And what the magnetic particle imaging scanner does is that it images iron that's 
we inject into a body. In this case, our patients are all rats or mice. We eventually want to get this up to a human size. And what we get out is images of basically where the iron has gone in the body. So here's a rat head, and you can see the carotid arteries of where the iron that we injected has pooled, or there's a large volume of blood. And then the blue haze is basically very small vessels within the body, capillaries that are filled with iron, and they're, but give less signal because they're very small. So in MPI, we have two, our model is made up of two pieces, our forward model. One called S, which splits our, what we're trying to image, the whole field of view, into pieces. And an operator called D, which basically says that, and both of these come from physics, D basically says, I don't know the average value. So when we think about this, say we have the lambda comp logo, right? The S operator says, I can only take a chunk. When I'm doing my magnetic fields due to power requirements, I can only image a chunk of the field of view at a time, right? I know which chunks I'm imaging, but I can only do it in pieces. The DC removal one takes a vector and then, or takes that patch that I had and removes the average value, which is actually exactly that operator we defined before, that matrix free operator up here, I minus M, except for through composition. We do it through functions. So our model is simply this, the splitting operator matrix multiplied by the DC removal operator. And if I had, uh, this image patch thing is a little bit more complicated, so it's written in Python. Well, I reconstructed everything in Python because I didn't have time to remake some of these. Um, add together. So here, I made the Lambda Conf logo. I stole it from John uh, from online. And it's a 3D printed part where it's about five millimeters deep, but then it has wells that are in the shape of our favorite logo that are about three millimeters deep. And I filled it with iron. That's what the brown part is. I filled it with iron nanoparticles that I want to image. So what I do is that I can take an image. This is a real image off of our scanner that was in production, which is now going to the uh, University of, uh, it's the Robart Institute at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. But this is a description of where the iron is within that phantom. Phantoms are like that, that block that I had. So this was all done, this image reconstruction, like the way I took the data, processed it, was done using a Python variant of what I showed you today. Completely unsafe on the shapes. It's much harder to use, but it does the same thing. And then what I was working on last week to show you kind of like that sparse example I had where I didn't know, where I wanted to reconstruct something but add more information, basically revolves around, um, I've taken too few samples. So in our system, we have what's called the radon transform which is basically like I've taken shadows of our image. So if I take too few projections, I end up, it kind of doesn't show up here, I end up getting these spokes. And my liver, this is a liver from a real rat at Stanford. Um, the liver, the lobes of the liver don't show up right. I've taken too few projections. But if I do that same constraint that I had before, that same sparsity constraint, I can reconstruct beautifully the original iron distribution with fewer samples than I had before. And then this process, originally, when I was, gonna, when I was calculating it out, it was sparse. It was gonna take 12 gigabytes of memory. Now it takes 30 megabytes, much less. This is enough that I can now reload parts of it onto the GPU and run the whole thing 20 times faster than I was before. All by using, defining certain pieces of my operations as matrix free, and where those pieces um, compose together, where I don't have to really be concerned about writing everything out directly. So what did we learn today? We learned that we have algorithms with uh, provable properties of convergence, but sometimes when we write the algorithms, uh, it fails us because we can call them incorrectly. We lose some of that rigor when going from math to actual programming. But if we add shapes back at the type level, we can make sure that kind of everything is okay that we can do the things that we expected. And by doing so, the shapes guide our implementation. We can only do it one way in a lot of cases. We cannot make up the wrong answer, the wrong composition functions. So that is my talk. I've gone over time, but do you have any questions? <laughs>